Hi, welcome to Bookmark. I'm your host, Don Noble. Today's guest is Paget Powell, author of Edisto and eight other works of fiction. Most recently, a volume of short stories, Cries for Help, Various. Please join me here in the Lurleen B. Wallace Library on the campus of Troy University as I speak with author Paget Powell. Mr. Powell, thank you for coming in. Thank you, Don. It's uh, it, 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 This is something we've been planning for longer than I thought it was going to take. You and I spoke in Nashville at the uh, at the uh, uh, conference for the book mm -hmm. Southern mm -hmm. Southern. Uh, and that would have been about last fall, right? October ish. Mm -hmm. And you had a brand new book, Cries for Help, <clears throat> which I went to the reading. Mm -hmm. I heard you read. I thought. It'd be fun to sit and talk with this man. Mm -hmm. But you've not been on this show before. So in a sense, let's begin at the beginning. <clears throat> You're presently teaching at the University of Florida in Gainesville, and you were born there? Yes, I was. I was born teaching at the University of Florida <laughs> in 1952. I bet it feels that way. And I didn't get tenure <laughs> until about 1986. That's the longest on record. Um, no, I left Gainesville around 54, grew up around North Florida, uh, Tallahassee, Orlando, when Orlando was an orange grove, not Disney World, Jacksonville, and um, I wound up, <clears throat> I was out in Houston where I'd been a roofer and I'd gone to writing school to meet women, and a friend of mine called up and said, aren't you from Florida? And I said, yeah, and he said, well, there's a job there. Why don't you get it and get the hell out of here? And uh, I said, where's the job? He said, University of Florida, Gainesville. And I thought, well, that's an interesting idea to go back, you know, to my hometown where I didn't grow up. And uh, long story short, I, not really wanting it, I got the job. People have asked you, uh, you know, how I think this is going slightly out of vogue, thank God. But dust well, let, jacket, let's, dust jackets, let's go out of vogue. Dust jackets used to have these ridiculous um, pseudo-biographies. This man was a, a, a tuna fisherman in Alaska, and then he was a bartender in Hong Kong and so on. Mm -hmm. But you were actually, for a good long time, a roofer in Houston. Yes, I was. And people have asked you, I know, th I know this has happened before f with you, but they've asked you, what do you think, in terms of, uh, of a person's writing day, a person's writing productivity, is, is it better off to be, are you better off to be a manual laborer, a roofer, or are you better off on a campus, sitting at a desk, <coughs> teaching students, reading books? Now, any, Don, does it make any difference? Now, Don, I think you know the answer to this question. <laughs> uh, I, I know my answer. Yeah, I would prefer the background uh, that has something to do with the world and uh, the background that keeps you from becoming a soft and pudgy thing at, at a desk. and so forth, um, all of which was operating when that friend of mine said, there's a job there, you should get it, and get the hell out of here. I didn't really want that kind of job. But I was with a woman, I had gone to school to meet women and had met one who wanted to have children. And in order to do, to do that, you need designated income. You, you have to grow up at some point, and so I took that job. I'm <clears throat> in one sentence going to say you're not a southern writer you're not in the tradition of of um, the Faulkner Welty O'Connor gang mm -hmm. are you yes and no I, I've spent a good deal of <coughs> my energies making fun of people who believe um, <laughs> but in order to do that you're you're believing yourself or you did once believe and I, I'll confess to this, walking around Montgomery this morning, I felt a little bit of the old hauntedness, the old hallowedness, the old vapors. The wawa? The wawa. <laughs> the wawa. Yes, I make fun of the wawa. Yes, you have. But you can get in circumstances where you think that maybe <clears throat> Faulkner's plighty <clears throat> lived in this house, and you can become seduced by it and, and, and believe that something 
better happened then. Something large happened, and, and it's not here now, and oh, don't we miss it. And, and you're going down that little mm -hmm. slide unto the believing, unto the earnest knowing. And uh, I, I then have to throw myself off the slide. Yes. Go back home to rotten Florida where these, these <laughs> delusions and these ghosts don't operate quite so openly. What is, there's a phrase you used more than once a while back. Uh, m m was it mitigate the porn? The co <laughs> mitigate the pwn? Mitigate, something like that. Mitigate the pwn. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> yeah. The pwn is, is, the, is the believing. The one hundred percent believing. Well, your first book, in, in a way, the most realistic book. Although I just recently took the opportunity to read um, the sequel to mm -hmm. Edisto, mm -hmm. which I liked very much. Well, but, it's I mean, a better book. I, I I really enjoyed it. You're a good reader. But thank you. <clears throat> that first book, though, was the runner-up for the National Book Award. Yes, it was, and, and it, was a great career it, maker for you. And it lost. Well, all the books but one lost. <laughs> Yes, but I, and so I was, th and, and I've heard you, I've heard you speak and read a good many of, of interviews that you've given over the years, and <clears throat> you would. You, you, one of the things that I th that that I sensed that you were projecting was that uh, since you went down the trail of of uh, of uh, the the somewhat metafictional, somewhat avant garde, that. Uh, that this was not bringing you the huge success that Edisto had brought. But I've learned since you won the Prix de Rome, mm -hmm. you won the James Black, the James Tate Black Award, which is the oldest award in England, isn't it? It's, it's yeah, it's, it's, well, yeah, it's the oldest UK prize. Yeah, that's and, pretty good. <clears throat> and I must tell you this, this is the prize I was trying to reclaim on the drive down, the name of, it was slipping my mind. Uh, when I was shortlisted for that prize, I got a note from my teacher in college, uh, Nan Morrison, who, oh, I must say, I believe is from Troy, Alabama. She's the model for the doctor, the Duchess, oh. in Edisto. Uh -huh. I got a note from her saying, the James Tate Prize, James Tate Black Prize, is, to my mind, second to the Nobel, and I thought, well, you don't gainsay the Duchess. No. And which book won that? I believe that that, that prize was conferred for my book called Over There, You and I. And in America, <laughs> you it's, and me. It's you and me, and would you like to know why that is? Because they're more interested in grammar than we are. Uh, they're a little bit more interested in f in correctitude <laughs> than we are. Yes, yes. But you have a series of fictions, <clears throat> interrogative, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. you and me mm -hmm. in America. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a, you have the interrogative mood. You have a book of a collection of imperative sentences. Right, a little piece called The Imperative Mood that, then, that went as far as it could go. And also I had one uh, called The Indicative Mood, right. which is what all b most books are. Most, sure. most books are in The Indicative Mood. I tried The Imperative Mood, and those both just stalled out um, for various reasons. But The Interrogative Mood had real traction. And You and Me is entirely readable. Well, you and me was written. You and I. It comes from a joke in the, in the book. That it's a dialogue book, as you know. And and one of the old guys says, "Well, it's just us now. You and me. You and I." He, he corrects himself, and uh, yeah. that's where it comes from. And yeah. so, for the American editor to want to call it you and me, made me ill. I said, "Man, it doesn't even acknowledge the joke that this this comes from." He said, "I know, but." You and I, it's just too formal for Americans. And I said, it's too correct, Matt. Just say it. Mm. And uh, Okay, that was a colorful, vapid tangent. Where were we? Where, where we are <laughs> is just about <laughs> in the present tense. That is, <clears throat> when I heard you read from Cries for Help, you introduced this as, very playfully, as a 
collection of failures. Fail novels. Fail novels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The original. What, what did you mean by that? Well, the original title for this book was uh, actually, um, you know, it was Cries for Help, various. 45 failed novels. Was meaning? I, meaning that uh, very few of the pieces in here are shaped as a story should be shaped for that emotional discharge and payoff. When I write, it's going to last a paragraph or three pages or 13 or 182, and I don't know. Now, because you when don't it gets plan in, or when outline. It, right. When, when it gets to 182, we can sort of securely call it a novel. Sometimes we put a question mark on it, as, as I did on Interrogative Mood. But it's in the length that looks like a novel. But a 13-page thing or a three-page thing is supposed to, by default, be called a story. But it would be better, I think more honest, to just say, no, that's a failed novel that, that stopped short of the 180 pages. It just halted. Some of these stop 179 pages short. Yeah, I don't think I actually have any 180-page <laughs> manuscripts. Yeah. Well, some of these are, I'm going to ask you to read some, some bits okay. from, from here. I can read bits. Some are, <clears throat> some of these stories, almost none of them are literary except uh, the one that, that stars Janis Joplin and Charles Dickens. Uh, by, by, hand, which, by which you mean what? Because, well, because Dickens a, elusive uh, literary characters or writers as characters in the stories and so on. Looking like a story. Yeah. In that yeah. sense. Mm -hmm. um, although Made up people doing made up things. Yes, those mm -hmm. were re but these were real people. And then, of course, Boris Yeltsin as, as well. Mm -hmm. And I, I was tickled. The ones that tickled me the most are, of course, the ones that I, that I would like you to read some bits of. All right. Um, and you're not particularly, you're not CNN, you're not doing commentary on uh, the day's events. <clears throat> but the Thank Yeltsin God. dancing, mm -hmm. I thought, was, everybody knows who Boris Yeltsin is. Uh, yeah. Au contraire. Uh -oh. I, I did a reading in Ocala, Florida, and I, I felt like reading these Yeltsin pieces that night. And I said, now you all know who Boris Yeltsin is, right? <laughs> Whole room, no <laughs> hand raised. You guys know who Boris Yeltsin is? <laughs> Okay. You're looking a lot better than they do down there in Ocala. Well, he was briefly in charge of the Soviet Union. He certainly was, and uh, he was the first elected president who left office peacefully. And I guess he's the only one. So far. So far. Right? Yeah. Um, you've got some pencil marks here. That's what you... Um, oh, those are for me. That's Just read a couple of paragraphs. They'll get the flavor of it. All right. To Putin... I have given over everything but the nuclear suitcase. As dense as it is, I feel pretty light on my feet, with only the suitcase on my hands. I look good with it, my white hair and the red suitcase. It got stuck under the bed, and I popped a latch off, extracting it. Regrettable, but the other latch holds. The landlady was demanding the rent, and I had to move quickly. Moreover. I have found the nuclear suitcase to be a superior chick magnet. Westerners in the know assure me that it can hold its own, a nuclear suitcase, with a BMW. I have replaced the cyanide vial in the handle with a three-pack of condoms. I consider this a practical post-Cold War accommodation and not a sacrifice to the original genius of the design. I am more likely to contract an STD than I am to have to deploy the suitcase. And it goes on. <clears throat> now, that is a, a, based on, uh, obviously, contemporary event. But mm -hmm. the, the Joplin and Dickens, which is which early, is, early, mm -hmm. page 7, 9, somewhere quite, quite early. This is, mm -hmm. this is literarily fanciful. Yes. R read us a bit of that. <clears throat> Here's or set the, it up as you as you see fit. Here's the opening, and the opening is designed to enter forcefully into the to announce forcefully you're on the other end of the spectrum. The not to be believed, not belief suspension is not to occur. What? Right. You know, I used to think Coleridge came up with that phrase, but 
but I think it's not Coleridge. And I can't figure out or retain who did say it. It may have been Charles Lamb, but I don't know. I'm talking about the phrase, uh, the willing suspension of disbelief. Janis Joplin at her desk regards Charlie Dickens at his and wonders. That boy could be the answer, or one of the answers, to the long question that will trouble her. Will I be the loneliest girl on earth? The dog of loneliness is already, at age nine, nuzzling her. Because it is, after all, a dog, and nuzzling, and she nine, the dog of loneliness nuzzling little Janis Joplin at this point is merely cute. It will not be so cute later when she has bad skin and has wrecked her voice and swings that bottle of southern comfort at it as it tries to lick her face all sweaty on stages. Oh my, this is poetic. Let's abjure poetry because the conceit of this, Janis Joplin and Mr. Dickens, a century out of his time, is already inane. We will stick to the facts and try not to be pretty. She has heard Charlie Dickens use pretty big words early in the third grade. And this goes on. A couple more little bits, if you would. Sure. Um, I have, uh, <clears throat> on 174, there's a bit called Utopia, mm -hmm. and I think it's a, a quite short opening, is it not? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a failed novel at about one page <laughs> of length, um, and I probably would make sense, I'm afraid, to read the whole thing if I read it, read some of it. Is that Sure, why not? All right, this is called Utopia. A man in a cigar-colored suit is not to be trusted, and frankly, my aversion to that one over there goes well beyond mistrust. I outright do not like the son of a bitch. A cigar-colored suit. I am pursuing my dissertation on agiation. That is the new science of getting old in case you need to know what I am talking about. You probably don't. Sometimes I myself wonder why anyone needs to know anything about agiation, when for thousands of years people just did it without being told a goddamn thing about it, and they got along fine, getting old right on schedule, and getting into their final pajamas, etc. I wonder why anyone needs to know anything about anything when you get right down to it. In this same spirit of wonderment, I wonder why everyone has to suddenly be on the phone all the time. Everyone has suddenly decided they have to know what everyone else is up to at every minute of the day. How did this happen? We have all become the president. There is a new society forming. It is going to allow only running water in a house, a three-channel TV, a rotary dial phone, a ringer washing machine, and one car. When the cigar-colored suit-wearing asshole is not wearing that, he is wearing a sky blue one. It would be fun and gratifying to see a car knock him out of his shoes. There they would sit, some kind of Italian superiority, empty on the road, nearby which groans the lump who wore them to that forlorn spot. The ambulance might be forever in coming. What will become of the shoes? I despise that asshole. I would hope that a bum would come along and fit himself into the shoes and shamble off in them, perhaps right by the paralyzed face of the owner, who could just force himself to groan, my shoes. <laughs> yeah, now, the bum says, I clicking and clacking down the track now. 
So I ended that novel right there. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> Wasn't like, any point going like any further like with that the right one. spot. <clears throat> I have heard two separate, you know, in the in the really, really very small world of writers who live uh -huh. in the South, I've heard two rumors, let's call them. One rumor is that you are writing a novel at present that involves a gigantic snake. Another rumor is mm -hmm. that you are writing a novel that involves Buffalo in Montana mm -hmm. and, Ted, and Ted Turner. Mm -hmm. Either one, a different one, none? What, well, what are you doing now? They're What's the next? They're rudiments <coughs> of, of veracity <coughs> in all of these uh, misappropriations. I have written uh, about the indigo snake, a giant purple friendly snake that is this close to extinction. Ah. And in fact, here's some Alabama based intel. They are currently being reintroduced uh, on a highly experimental level, which is to say very likely to fail level. They're being introduced in Conecuh uh, National Forest right. by Auburn University. If I write a book, it won't be a novel. It will be a compendium of um, colorfully vapid tangents in and around the idea of saving the snake, right. which is hopeless. Ted Turner's been an obsession of mine for years and years and years. Right. Uh, he appears in my fiction here, here, Hither and Thither, uh, once notably in a book that was then called Mrs. Hollingsworth's Men, he and Jane Fonda were uh, in the book, and Ted was the backer of a project uh, to, to show a hologram of Nathan Bedford Forrest uh, at large on the land and, and see who responded to him in the appropriate fashion. And he was going to use oh. those people in a eugenics program to breed the new Southerner and bring, bring oh. back that lost hollowness that we were talking about inarticulately early. The extinction. <clears throat> the extinction, yeah. yes. And uh, uh, unfortunately, that was Houghton Mifflin who had some weird policies, and their legal department did not let me use the name of Ted Turner. I was going to be sued by Ted Turner, which would, of course, made me so many million dollars. But of course, that was not allowed to happen. Ted wasn't going to sue me anyway, but there was there's a tiny hope that Jane would, which would be better. <laughs> so should we look for either of these? Well, I restored that book. It's, uh -huh. it's under its original title. It's called Hologram. Uh -huh. It's available as an e-book from Open Road Media. Uh, and uh, there it is, Ted Turner and Jane Fonda. I haven't been sued yet. Good, and, um, good. Well, I have not read... Regrettably. I have not yet read Hologram. I have actually read your article on the Indigo Snake, but mm -hmm. I did not know you were thinking about it a book-length study. Well, if I weren't lazy, I, I already would, would be doing that. Um, I am continuing to, to pursue it. In fact, I'm going to go from here to Conecuh and, and see right. if somebody can show me the release grounds and, and see what's going on. Well, have fun doing that, and I know, I know you're going to be at the festival tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Enjoy that. Okay. This has been a pleasure. I will. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Don. Thank you very much.